Welcome back to the show, everyone. Shout out to JewishCoffeeHouse.com for continuously supporting this network and this show. Today, we have with us Jessica Roeder, a French Jewish scholar, a professor, and author. Welcome. Thank you. Jessica. Thank you so much, Francesca. This is a great pleasure to be here today and to share you know, my story with you. Yeah, it's so exciting to have this conversation with you. Just a little background for anyone listening. Jessica has interviewed me as one of many Orthodox women she has been researching for her latest book, which is called Beyond the Shetel. Correct, right? Yes, yes. And um, we have met up in addition to our interview where we went even deeper and I had such a lovely time. It's probably the only time I had a face-to-face -face with anyone since COVID started. So I really enjoyed it and I am so excited to bring you onto the show to really get the analysis on what's going on in this industry, what has happened since the digital age came in and through the Orthodox entertainment industry for women completely upside down. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So uh, we'll start the show just like we start every other show. I'd love to learn a little bit more about your background, uh, where you grew up, where your interest into music, the arts, and the Jewish element to it began. Mm -hmm. But first of all, I would like to say that I'm very happy. This is a great honor to be on your podcast, Francesca after you know having the chance to meet you online and in person and listening to all the podcasts so this is this is a wonderful opportunity um so as you can hear and as francisca said i'm french i grew up in a french guyana in south america in a what we call french department overseas in a very diverse um environment cultural and religiously i grew up completely secular and uh, when I was, um, it started when I was 12 years old, I went to the UK, I have a cousin over there. And at that time, my cousin was, uh, one of my cousin was in Israel in a kibbutz. And this is a moment where I started to reconnect with Judaism, with uh, my, my roots, my Sephardic roots. And, um, and then when I was 17 years old, I moved to Paris. And this is when I studied musicology, piano, and also classical piano. Um, at the conservatory and also dance, so really into the art that I also recognized, you know, um, to to Judaism, and um, so my journey between the art and Judaism is a is a long one. There's a by, and, and especially with orthodoxy, uh, I would say that in the last ten for the first. I went from 2001 to the end of my PhD, 2013, I really focused on, on Sephardic heritage. And I would say people who are much more like me, who were, you know, Jewish, but um, who didn't grow up in a Jewish environment, but who reconnect uh, with their Jewish heritage. So a lot of uh, Judeo Spanish people that I've met in France, in Paris, were part of this this heritage from the Ottoman Empire, which is different than, than mine. My mom is, was born in Algeria, in North Africa, and my father was uh, from the north of Spain. And um, so that's the beginning of this journey between, I would say, Jewish culture and more specifically the art. So the focus was on the role of music for these people and literature as well and culture in general to recognize and learn about their heritage. So that's right. the starting point. That's the starting point. And what did you learn or what were your biggest take takeaways as you were working on this research? Yeah, that's a big question. <laughs> you know, we, we are, have this tendency to write to, you know, but the, 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 I the know, struggle. It's a very unfair question because the, we but spent it's, years researching. But it, and, yeah. This is a great this is a great question. Actually, recently the Moment magazine there was um, a specific or you know a soundtrack for Jewish um, music, and they asked us to choose one song. So, I would say that the biggest takeaway um, for me was so historical and so in terms of contemporary, really to to imagine and to to discover that there is this possibility of learning about her heritage because I, I was working um sephardic music is is really much more a heritage that uh, was not passed on from generation to generation 
And a lot of people we learn thanks to scores, thanks to recordings, and a lot of professional musicians were teaching um, the heritage to people from the community. So thinking about cultural, and, and a lot of those artists were not part of this Judeo-Spanish heritage. So that was a very interesting phenomenon. And the other thing is that it was a so-called a traditional music that was on stage. So thinking about the stage as a place, not only um, that, is, that is about, uh, especially in ethnomusicology, in, in a lot of scholars were looking down at tradition that were on stage. So the tradition is the one that you can hear at home or for your religious events or for weddings, for bar mitzvah and all those kind of activities. And thinking about this music as being on stage and being a space to transmit and heritage to transmit also emotion and as an educational space as well. So that's the first thing. And the other one was um, in connection to Jewish music in general and to think about Jewish music and in this context Sephardic music as part of the world music, as part of the, the global world um, that is transcending borders, that is integrating the digital area, et cetera, et cetera. So that would be my two main thing. Right. And that leads us into your second book, correct? Yes. So indeed, my first, so my first book was published also in France, in French. And um, so what happened is that I was, I, I was traveling or living between Paris and Montreal. And when I settled in Montreal, I, I was much more connected to the Francophone Sephardic Moroccan community. I also worked um, on the composer. His name is Samuel Magribi, who was um, an extremely famous composer, singer in Morocco in the 50s and 60s. And uh, the Hasidic community was always something that fascinated me. And everybody was like, forget about it. You don't speak Yiddish. This is not your community. You will not get access to it. And um, so it started in 2015. And uh, what happened is that I started to meet a lot of people who left the community. And progressively, um, and a lot of artists as well in film and in music. And progressively also people who are in between those two worlds. And, um, and then I taught for a year or so. And I started to meet a lot of women in the community. And the art was always there. I knew that, you know, music is part of what we call the, the Orthodox world and especially the Hasidic world. And I was like, what about women? And uh, progressively things started to open up. Up. Some women were talking about, you know, Rachel's plays, the Broadway, the women only performance, and everything started to open up. And uh, I started, I decided in 2018 that I will focus on, on the art. Uh, initially, I really wanted to focus on music, but I found that also um, looking at um, the from female space, there's a lot of intersection between different types of art. So, um, you know, you, you, you are a composer of melodies, but you compose also the lyrics, or you might not necessarily compose the lyrics, but you might be invested also in dance or film or uh, performance plays. There's a lot of interaction uh, between different types of art. So that's why also I started to think about from female artists at, at large and, and, uh, it started in 2018. At the beginning, I said, I, I didn't mention that, but I wanted to look at the difference between men and, um, and, and women in terms of their the performances, the, the economy, the different aspect. But um, at the end, there were so many things in the, <laughs> in the, in the, for, for, women, I would say that I, I said things started to, I, to open up a, a lot. And I said, okay, the book will, will be just on, on women. There's so many things to say and to write about. Yeah, I love how you describe the journey of really finding what the book is about, having an idea, but then listening and following what the story is telling you or what's actually happening and then saying, wow, this is something that needs to be addressed. And I'm just so honored to be a part of something that's research worthy. And I want to shout out here, give a shout out to Rivka Harris for connecting us. And I wanted to yes. just ask a side question when you taught for a year and as a professor now, and I, I know you, you are a tenure 
can you explain yeah, tenure? <laughs> yeah, can you on the tenure track? <laughs> you're on the tenure track. Yeah, can you explain that to anyone who just has no idea in academia how anything works? Oh yes. Um, so depends on your field, uh, but it's also a long journey, like any 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 journey. And you never know if you know the, the job market is 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 very difficult now, but there are different possibilities in academia you don't need necessarily to have a tenure track position you can also have a teaching position um there they are also some industry or lab that will hire scholars just to do research uh in my case when i taught for a year to hasidic women it was um a college degree so there was a special um degree for social worker and i taught socio-anthropology it was a within Bisyakov, but I was a, a, a specific program for women. And at that time, I was what we call a postdoc. So after your PhD, uh, usually because today the job market is very competitive. And in general, when you apply for, for a position, you already need to have some publications. Um, so you apply for grants, you apply for fellowships. Sometimes there is already a research project and you apply to work there, or sometimes you also have your own project and you submit you know, an application and you, you, um, you are selected based on your project. So you also need, depends on your discipline, but to always be in conversation with what's going on around you. So, and to think about the novelty of your, your, your research. And then, uh, you know, we apply uh, to many, many jobs. <laughs> uh, and there is, there is the, the mobility. Initially, I didn't, I, I was in Montreal and I really wanted to stay in Canada because also I started a family in Canada and it became, um, you know, difficult. And there was this moment where after so many years, the job market is much more limited in, in Canada than in the US. And I didn't want it to go back to Europe also, even if there is some, there are some, some, some opportunities over there, but I didn't really invest it in Europe. And then when you, if you have a job, it's um, a turn track job, you also, there's a lot of uh, investment in terms of publications and grants and a lot of backlash, you know, rejection, <laughs> acceptance. So I think there's a lot of similarities with an artist, you know, um, to, to, you know, to believe in what you do and to have um, uh, feedbacks and to continue your, your work. Yeah. And so just to make it clear, right now you work in George? I jo uh, I'm an assistant George. professor at Georgetown University right. uh, at the School of Foreign Service. So I teach mainly to undergrad students who might, so the School of Foreign Service is the School of Diplomacy. So I have a lot of students, and I teach um, music, a lot of courses on music and globalization. And I course, and I have uh, other half is based on you know Jewish studies. My home is a center for Jewish civilization, so I have both had the ethnomusicology and the Jewish studies, uh, looking at you know Jewish diversity and um, yeah. So that would be okay. So I'm just going to simplify for anyone who's listening who does not know anything what Dr. Jessica Rota just explained. Um, Jessica has been studying and has accumulated a lot of experience, knowledge, and um, research in multiple locations over the world. She has been accepted to teach at a university in her areas of expertise and is paid to do more research and mm -hmm. to keep on publishing. Exactly. Exactly. Okay, so this is a win-win-win situation in the area of academia because you are able to really focus on your passion areas of interest and to continue to publish and be viewed and and raise in, you know, in the academia ladder of what's the word? Hmm. Um you know, move, it's not the corporate, move up in the academia ladder. Yes, yes. Yeah. And, okay. and I, would, I would say also this is something that, um, you know, when you're not tenure yet, it's, it's sometimes it's a little bit difficult. But to engage also, that's a lot what academia is trying to do. I'm thinking here about my colleague, Eric Allaire, who is at Concordia University, who was my postdoc advisor, who was doing exhibit and engaging with artists also. So there's a lot of collaboration um, 
and and this flexibility because indeed we have a secure job is is amazing is 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 uh it's a great opportunity we are you know all of us that have this opportunity are extremely lucky um so yes this is this is this is that's so beautiful yeah okay <laughs> so now back to your area of research at this moment the book you are working on and what i am so excited to be talking to you about today is that you have the real inside scoop on what's happening in the from female arts community mm -hmm. so i have to be very careful with what i ask you because you have so <laughs> much information and i don't want to waste this interview so there's a little bit of pressure here for if me as well <laughs> Well, you have a whole book to write. And if anyone asks you a question, you just tell them, go read my book, you know? Yeah, they need to wait. <laughs> they need to wait. So if you had to compartmentalize or divide your research into a few categories, what would they be? What would your main categories be? Okay. Uh, so first of all, um, I'm looking at, I would say, three main spaces in this large sphere that we call the that i we can call the from female artists so the first one because also this book this research is a reflection of my own journey so the main argument that i'm trying also to to make is to discuss and to talk about the connection between different level of from you know within the from from kites between women who eventually left the community women who are more in i would say the middle they are not modern orthodox they are they are litvish but it can also be hasidic more than hasidic so this category in this emergence of the from female artist this concept of the professional from female artist who engage on social media who is also engaging in industry i think this is this is something very unique and very pretty new in film and in in music and uh, same thing with the artists who left. They engage with an industry, but they're also trying to, today, some of the artists are trying to create a new industry because they're not really happy with the mainstream industry as Netflix and Amazon. And the last one, the last sphere is the really private industry where actually we can't even call it an industry. So this is much more the underground or the very private sphere um, where for instance, you can listen to some songs on hotlines or you have a lot of recording studios where women and, you know, are engaging in um, creativity with the recording studio, but they're not releasing on social media, but they're just sending it through emails or hotlines. Um, and this is a different space. So I will say in terms of the category, I organized my thought in terms of the public space. The middle one would be the counter public space. So this is not my term. A lot of other anthropologists wrote about this idea of the, the space that is in opposition to the public and that is not completely private. And so, and I would say here that social media is pretty central here. And the last one is much more the private space. However, with social media and technology and those transformation, it became much more complicated to really say this is completely private, this is completely counter public space, this is completely public, because there's a lot of overlap. And same thing with women that I'm working with, uh, there's a lot of overlap between, you know, okay, you left the community, but you taught or you're teaching within the community art, a part of art, or you're really in the private sphere, but you, you, you were invited by Francesca on her podcast and engaging <laughs> with other, other women who have different perspectives on what it means to be a from female artist, what it means to be an Orthodox or Hasidic uh, woman and to sing or to produce music. So that, that's, I, that's very comprehensive. I enjoyed that very much. What would you say um, the newer challenges are and how do you think the more, you know, the from, not the ones who left, but the from and the Hasidic, mm -hmm. the Hasidic 
singers you talk about, how are they dealing with it, you know, from your outside perspective? And how, what does it look like from an outsider? And not to say you're an outsider, but you're not the from female yeah, singer definitely. Who grew up in Brooklyn. Yeah. <laughs> yes. You can say that I'm a, you know, it's fine. I, I'm, I, I assume, I, you know, I'm an outsider who is, you know, trying to, to connect really strongly as, as, you know, anthropology. Anthropology is here. As and, Jew, and by the way, also. you are totally not <laughs> an outsider. <laughs> but yes. you have a specific um, expertise that you're bringing to the table as being an outsider from mm-hmm. the research angle. So that's angle. just clarifying. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. Thanks. Thanks a lot, Francesca. Um, so in terms of the challenges, I mean, recently there was, so in terms of film, for instance, and I think there's a lot of similarities with, with, with music, with the from professional one, is the income with, um, you know, the material object. So for a long time, I mean, the first 10 years in the, mu- in the film from female industry, so they, ha- they have the screening, which is the moment where you make the most of your money during Halamoid. And then same thing with concert. This is the moment where you have your income. And then you have the DVDs or you have the streaming and the CDs and you don't make money. So in terms of the film industry, for instance, the question now, and I know um, they're, they're, uh, Dina Perstian, who is in, in Israel, for instance, she doesn't sell her DVDs. So there's a question of modesty, I think initially, but progressively, I think also she, so there's two things. There is the modesty, but also economically, I think it's, it's much more, it's better for her because you don't have the DVD. So if you really want to watch her movie, you need, you need to, to request a screening. Um, so the challenge that I can see is what's going to be the future of this industry for the film, for instance, specifically, because in the, you know, we have now Netflix and um, all those platforms online. Can we imagine that we'll have a Jewish platform like we do have today where you can download, you know, you go on mostly music, you go on Ningu music, you can, you know, download or you can buy, but you can't stream. It's not a Netflix or Amazon. Can we imagine that we'll have the same thing for the film? So that's for, for the film or maybe it's going to disappear because it's, it's expensive. A movie, making a movie, it's very expensive. For the, for the music. Something um, just changed in your audio quality. I'm just, oh, did something just. No. Okay. That, that's what it was before. Oh, Okay. Yeah, I don't know what happened. I just is it, want is it to be the same. Perfect. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Keep talking. Um, so in terms of the music, so you have, for instance, your work, the, the, what I call the professional from female artists who are producing, who are uh, really engaging with an industry, with a, a professional in music video, um, in, in music production, really invest and have a knowledge about the industry. And here you have the, the same, I would say, almost similar challenge that in our, except that uh, in terms of performance, you perform only for women. But in terms of selling your material, um, your production, this is the same challenges that any kind of artist uh, will deal with. And I think here, uh, and that's what I observe, um, and you will tell me if what, what you think about that, but I think a lot of, of professional from female artists are really looking at what's going on in terms of, or how do professional uh, musicians, not in the film world, are doing to get, you know, in, to think about the model. And then you have the Hasidic space, the more private space, where I think it has never been so productive for women because you don't need an instrument. You don't need to learn to play the piano, to play the guitar, to play, I don't know, to have a percussion. You can, you know, you singing, it, it, good or not so good, but it doesn't matter. You, you're, you're singing um, and you have your friend or a woman, you know, this woman, she has a recording studio. She is great. She can make arrangement and she creates, you go there, you record. And I'm, I'm thinking about, um, I don't know if you, you, you heard about the, the, the cover of a Hada show. Uh, there is an English version. I accept that started to circulate it. Um, and I heard, I listened to it the first time in a Zumba class. 
or it was not a Zumba class actually, it was a dance exercise class in Brooklyn. And then I listened to it on a hotline. And now there is a Yiddish version of the song that people in New York listen to it, you know, in Canada as well. So there is a, a kind of, um, you know, a lot of uh, exchanges. So here they, they are producing and producing and they're circulating, but also I can feel recently, I think, yeah, yesterday, a woman were talking to me that they, are, they want to make a music video. So I say, okay, it's very interesting, but who's gonna, how are you gonna search? So they, they use emails, they use hotlines, but how are they gonna distribute. pursue their, this? yes, exactly. So you have an informal market. Uh, so for instance, here in Montreal, and the ground, yes. <laughs> and I'm, I'm thinking here in Montreal, there is a technology lady, for instance, who is helping to connect a lot of, so she's using the very private, but also the more professional singers from female, you know, artists, and she's the reference. So, um, so, so, but the, the main in terms of the, you ask me about the difference. So I try to explain the, cha the challenges that I can see in depth. So the, the future will definitely be about um, transformation in the way we can think about creativity and, um, and what exactly the arts mean within the from female sphere. And here I'm talking about the professional one and even the Hasidic one, because you have more production, you have more possibility, sounds um, possibility. And this concept of the professional or um, the more expert, or you want to have a better quality in terms of images, you want to have a better quality in terms of sound, you want to have a different aesthetic experience. And just to conclude on this this thing about aesthetic is that when I worked on Sephardic music, the main question I had it was, how can we define Sephardic Judeo Spanish music? What is this music? Is it because you heard? I remember listening to some flamenco interpretation, some tango, some Middle Eastern. So what is this music? There's so many different sounds, and this is where I came to this idea that this is an heritage. So what defines this music is the melody that is rec recognizable and the lyrics. So the question that I'm also trying to understand is what is this, you know, orthodox music? How can we define this aesthetic, especially in the, in the female sphere? So yeah. how, how would you define that aesthetic? So, <laughs> <laughs> so how I, I was sure that you, you're going to ask the, the question. Um, so what is extremely surprising for me compared to the, the Sephardic world or even what's going on now with the, uh, the revival of Mesachim music from the 50s and 60s in Israel is that there are very few people who will try to look at and think about this music as an heritage, Look, looking at the past and trying to reintroduce the, pack, the past, you know, composer and to sing it. There is a constant, you know, um, creativity. So you are thinking about, uh, so the, the, a new song, okay, you have you know, the Tehillim, for instance, that you, so that's much more the, the, I would say the Hasidic sphere and you will take the, the, the lyrics and you will try to find a melody that is popular around you and a lot of time in the, in the male space. So to understand what is this aesthetic for now, you really need to look at what's going on in the, in the male space in terms of the, the sound that you can hear. But then you have a specific voice, um, a timbre that a lot of, um, women I think have, and they are really inspired by the, the pop North American voice. So if you listen to a lot of, of, of female artists, there is, there is this, this color of, you can think about any kind of North American popular culture. There's a lot of similarity in terms of the melodies, in terms of the rhythm as well. Um, while if you look at male, in terms of their voice, sometimes there is a more, um, and the noise, you know, especially nasal for Hasidic men, nasal sound, um, that has kind of a certain 
you know, similarity with Hasanut and women don't, you know, they don't sing, it's very rare to <laughs> sing Hasanut. Um, so in terms of the, the aesthetic, there is something different. And what I, and we discussed about that when we've met Francesca about my expectation or the, 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 my curiosity is to see how this, which kind of other style can we start to hear? and to listen when we think about from female um, creativity. Because a lot of people said this is Jewish music, but initially if you listen to the song, you will see that uh, there's a lot of techno background that you can hear in any kind of other music. And the essence of Jewish music is the borrowing of you know, musical sound. So what's going yeah. to be the, the future aesthetic? I, 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 and because now we have much more spaces for creativity and also need, um, I, I see also the from female professional uh, artists, are, are, they are really creating a, a new space, new opportunities that is completely global. And here, uh, this is where I would say orthodox, not necessarily, necessarily not modern orthodox, but the orthodox or the Hasidic modern, they're kind of together and, and, and trying to, to think about um, the art for the art, but also the art as an income, as a profession. And this is a completely new concept. That's definitely something very new. Yeah. So there's so much here to unpack. And I'd like to just go over a few things before we move on. So you mentioned the lack of, well, and this was my analysis. I think I've mentioned it before in the podcast at some point that the reason women have a lot more freedom in sounding more North American popular music like versus mm -hmm. the male industry is because the men are expected to provide that traditional entertainment at weddings and bar mitzvahs and events. And there's a certain Jewish sound that's expected at traditional events, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Jewish life events, versus the women aren't accompanying those life events and they have the freedom to really sound like pop culture, potentially. So you, you want me to go? So I think- no, so I, I was just, that was my little, uh, do you agree or? So yes, and, and, and I think if, so, especially for today, for what you're doing for, I'm thinking about um, Deborah Schwartz or um, Baraha Shafa as well, all um, Nehama Cohen, Dobi Bomb, all trying to really think about alternative spaces where women can perform. But if you think about the Tzedaka event, for instance, or are you thinking about camps or schools, there's still some expectations about what you have to provide, not in terms of the, the voice, but in terms of the music that you're going to bring. And I don't think that in those spaces, we are transcending yet the expectation. And I remember having, you know, discussion with a lot of, and listening to a lot of other women saying, okay, I came there and, and, you know, they were expecting ABC, even in terms of, what I should wear, how the kind of persona that I have, the model that I have to be for this woman. However, because of the, the, the last five years, five, 10 years, this increase on digital platform, this community that I'm talking about, that I call the From Female uh, Artistic Space. Uh, I mean, it's not me who actually, it's you call it. <laughs> I, I'm, I'm sure that you, you, you use it all, also this term. This is sometimes on Instagram and hashtag. So this is yeah. not my term. Um, but um, in this experience, this is the idea of creating new opportunities that you don't need anymore the Tzedakah event. You want to organize a concert, you do so for an event. You don't need an organization necessarily behind you. Uh, you will find new ways to to do so and i think who knows maybe um those campaign to support music video uh quick starters um you the know, crowdfunding platform the cra yes so eventually that's gonna that's gonna grow and um and and we might we we can see that there's much more flexibility here definitely yeah I agree with what you say. Yes, even though uh, on their albums, women can have a little bit more freedom when they are performing or working for hire at schools or camps, they are expected to provide that Jewish yes. um, 
sound. I 100% relate to that. Let's talk about the level of professionalism. Mm -hmm. Is it a one big challenge pot, as they call it, when it comes to people who are actually professional versus people who can afford professional, but they're not quite professional versus totally not professional, but because they have a huge organization backing them, they are extremely successful, but they are not quality. They're not modeling uh, professional levels. Mm -hmm. And what, what does that do to the industry? I'm curious. Uh, okay. So I'm going to try to reverse and to really respond as an anthropologist. <laughs> you're going to see why I'm saying that because I'm not the judge to say what is, who is professional, who is not professional, how we define a professional in anything, you know, uh, training in, in, and experience, right. And also be recognized by your peer, by your by the industry, but recognition. So in the, in the music um, field or even in cinema field, so this is the idea that you have people, when you have a production, it's not only yourself, um, you know, to do a music video. Everybody can have today because we have a democratization. This is something amazing. Everybody can make a movie, but you still have some professionals of, you know, the, 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 um, the images who are able and who are connected with other professional to create a product that will have a certain aesthetic and certain expectation as professional. Same thing with the sound, same thing with the singing, same thing with the composition, same thing with, you know, with everything, with script, with everything. Um, so that's the concept of the professional. What is interesting for me and is to observe and to look at the discourse about this professionalism. And this is definitely in the most, you know, private space, Hasidic space, there is this awareness, they don't know how, of, oh, this one is very professional, this one is not as professional as this one. And um, usually it goes definitely with the voice, but also with the performance. So not necessarily knowing what is behind, but they have a sense of the, if the product sounds as, and you know, the same level as the, the male or the Goyish music, even if they listening to it or not, um, they have a certain idea about this professionalism. The other aspect is the training, which is very interesting because um, sometimes they don't, you know, they don't ask if you have a training, but to justify if she's professional or not, they will say she's professional and they know that it's because there is a training behind. Um, it's not only, you know, learning by yourself. But on the other hand, there is also something that is extremely valuable is that just the idea of the talent. You have a talent and you learn by yourself as well. Um, and, and this is something in a more private sphere uh, that, that I, you know, the, 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 the more Hasidic sphere, this is definitely what I observe. But a lot of, um, there is a need and a desire to take classes and courses to get more professional in terms of music or dance or, or theater or anything. And, um, and I think if you are in this category, I'm thinking here about um, Rivka Harris, uh, because she, she knows pretty well this in between being uh, with, with her daughter, who is extremely talented, um, that is trained professional pianist, for instance, but she doesn't fit neither in the secular world because, you know, she's, she's from, she's Orthodox and, and she doesn't fit also in the from female space because the expectations are different in terms of the, it's, it's not the kind of aesthetic that they will listen to. Um, but because we have now, um, I think some schools, and this is not only more one school or one teacher that you can go to, you have brother, um, much larger possibilities um, in, in music, in dance, in, in theater, um, I'm not sure in terms of theater, but definitely in dance and, and music and not necessarily instrument, but for voice, mm -hmm. 
and and here again in voice you can find everything and you know everybody can be a voice teacher <laughs> if you can but there you need the credential and that's now people want that people want okay I, she has the credential and even the Hasidic girl who the parents will have the, the money to pay her the lessons, she might want to have the, the teacher who is, has the credential. Exactly. Yeah. Well, that's an improvement. Definitely. So just a few more questions. Let's try to briefly touch upon them because we are running out of time and there are so many things I just still want to find out from your perspective on. So we touched upon um, primarily Orthodox, ultra-Orthodox, Hasidic. Where are the modern Orthodox women in the space? It's a good question. Um, I won't be able to respond to your... To your um, well, I could give you my analysis and you can confirm or deny. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I, I, but go, go ahead. I would be... Because I really don't talk to modern Orthodox um, So I women. think in Israel, there's a lot more of that. Mm -hmm. women who cover their hair slightly differently than the classic orthodox women women who will perform for mixed audiences because mm -hmm. it's jewish music and those men will be listening to women sing anyway and we just had kaylee halpern on the show and these were her exact mm -hmm. words mm -hmm. and so in israel because the jewish music or israeli music spiritual music is so much more in line with the culture and the pop culture mm -hmm. they easily fit into mainstream music and music and here in the states i don't know so i know of women who have pursued as as children musical uh education but it's not the practical route it's not a classic route for anyone who wants to live <laughs> a fulfilling jewish from life so they would either reject it have it in the hobby category but i don't see in america so much in north america mm -hmm. the modern orthodox women in the arts pursuing yeah i mean it's specific. it's a very be completely wrong no i mean it's um, i i i i don't think they are definitely they are not in this space that's that's for sure so where are they this is this is this is a good question i didn't um invested in in it i know that on social media you can you can find some of them um, definitely and but in terms of the art i i think also they don't have any issue they will go to university and to teach you know to to teach music to learn music i think in the um, oh what is this yiddish theater they had uh, some actresses that were orthodox but you know they, so they, they, were on stage. they get lost in the mainstream industry at large. Yes, that's that's my that's definitely my uh, not my analysis because I didn't your research, presumption. But my yes, exactly. Okay, so now kids versus adults. Mm -hmm. What's the difference? And I'm sure things have changed over the last decade. Yeah, so that's a big question. <laughs> we have to uh, do this very quickly. <laughs> yes. So also it depends where you you know if you talk to. I've met some some artists in you know women women artists in in Satmar who have a group amazing uh, musical group and I had long discussion about their teaching you know instruments to kids in the community and then they was explaining to me that after twelve years old so it depends. Okay, to summarize, it depends where you are, the difference between, you know, girls and, and women. What is clear is that I remember reading uh, the book of Ellen Koskoff in 20, 2001, who was a music in the Lubavitcher um, sphere, which is also another world, the Lubavitch area. Uh, but that's the one of the first uh, book who came out about Hasidic music in the last t uh, 20 years. And she said that among women, there is almost it's like invisible space. There's no women, professional women recording. So the only one was Kinneret and Rochel Miller for a while. And then you have Malky Ginniger, but it was only, you know, in the, in the 2000 and the late 90s. So very, very few. Um, and it was, you know, rare to be able to think about a large community of female artists. So there is definitely, as a woman, I think this is a strong paradox for me, that to see in schools for girls, the investment today in the art, because they really see it as an educational purpose, 
component also. Uh, it, this is increasing. And also as a way to include, to create and to reinforce sisterhood, because this is the idea you're going to give to each single girl a part, you know, in the play, a dance, and to really experience that. So this is something that they really um, encourage in many, many different schools. Uh, and then you're after 12 years old, depends on certain school will say, okay, the parents cannot come anymore because it's not so it's not uh, pri it's not private anymore so there is that aspect then there is some some women in a very more conservative space that are telling me no instruments are forbidden uh, so we were not able to have a keyboard or you know even the guitar it was a whole struggle in my family but then you know others in the same community had a keyboard so so I think, and, and then this person told me, yeah, I think this is my father. He just didn't want to have any keyboards. And so he just blame on this. We are not allowed to. So the question of allowed and not being allowed about instrument, this is, this is another topic. But the paradox between those, this increase in terms of the art and camps, you know, everybody wants to go to, before it comes to the studio to record, you need to record, you know, the background and to sing, to have a play at the end. This is so important. So this is, uh, it was always there, but I think it's increasing much more. We have, it's increasing, not, <laughs> so it's increasing. What's going to happen to those girls who are so talented and they might want more space after and also to think about it as a profession. And because your generation, Francesca, is showing that it's not Rochelle Miller, who I have the chance to discuss with, she said, you know, it was almost impossible. We, 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 so it was for Tzedakah, it was for educational purposes, but it was not her, it was not possible to have this as a kind of a profession. Well, I think today, of course, there are some challenges like, you know, being a musician and et cetera, but I think there is new opportunities. So um, we have to, to, to wait to see the transformation of those girls and what's going to happen to them yeah and as we spoke about this a little bit when we met there's a spiritual aspect to it the educational aspect but also for girls or women who or girls because we're talking about education when they mm -hmm. don't identify with the learning aspect to connect to judaism yes they bring in this artistic way for the girls to be able to develop and channel their relationship with god and judaism through singing about it and dancing about it and acting. Yeah, this is a very interesting point because I remember that some women told me, the, not your generation, but told me that for them, music and singing was their almost their religion, their way to connect to God, to Hashem. So that was something extremely, extremely um, strong. And you know when you th and even some some of um, one artist told me that the concept of art for the art that we have much more in the secular world that you think it's not part of the from kite, the from world. Uh, she said, I think actually that even in the secular world, the experience of art is a kind of a, it's a spiritual um, experience. So then she said, I think that eventually we have this concept of the art of, for the art, but thinking about art as parnasse, something that can, it's bring in what is bringing income. Um, this is the, the novelty. In the, in the, so I think there is a transformation in terms of what and how we define the art today. Right. So you the, still transition from art for to raise money for organizations or art to connect to Judaism to art as a profession and earning money. We're still lacking the art for the art, which is the, 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 the expression and the need to pursue and to continue training, to continue training, to continue the pursuit of art for the art which is a little bit lacking, right? Is that what you Yeah, saying? yeah. And uh, because the, the concept of the art for the art where you transcend borders and you don't care about uh, what are going to be the implication uh, for that, you really want to express yourself and you know that eventually you're going to be expelled. You know, you're going to write this book or you're going to, you're gonna, you know, think about the song 
that might receive attention or not, but you're just going to do it because this is what you feel inside. Um, this is definitely what I've heard from, from some of the artists who actually left were telling me that it was um, not enough because it was always, you need to say those words in the specific way. You need to, to, to act that way. You need to sing that way. You need to move your body in a certain way that they felt that it was not enough for them. Um, so that's, that's very difficult to, to talk about this concept of the art that transcends. But on the other hand, I think in any artistic, you know, any artist, if needs also to be part of a community where they share certain, you know, common aesthetic. So even if you transcend the borders in terms of your production, your artistic production, your book, after a while, you will create a new genre. So you might be at the margin for a while, but then you create a new genre and then you create a new community and you create a school, a new school, a new vision. Um, so this is um, definitely, I think we still have those clear, you know, borders in terms of what is possible. I would be very curious to, to see what's going to be the reaction with your future. I think you have certain plans in terms of pushing the, the boundaries, the aesthetic boundaries, Francesca. So I would be very curious to see what's going to happen with that. Sorry if I... No, I am also curious what's going to happen with it. Um, and based now that we're talking about me, I'd love to wrap up with, I know you've been listening to the, this podcast and I know that you've used it a little bit for your research, maybe a little bit mm -hmm. for entertainment as well. Mm -hmm. I'd love to know what are your thoughts on what you have learned over listening to so many interviews Oh, or maybe I, I, just what I'm doing. Yes. I think, I think. Definitely. I think what you, um, so who told me about your podcast? This is Miriam Gam, um, Miriam Gamliel. Yes. So Rivka Harris and Miriam Gamliel. So Miriam Gamliel, uh, told me about the Leah. podcast. Yeah. Miriam Leah. And, um, and I was like, wow, this is, this is just, uh, amazing. And I started to listen to your, and what was so fascinating for me is that you were able to create and to express, to materialize this global community that I was observing with so many different levels. So you have the women who are, you know, much more connected on social media, who have their, 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 albums on you know spotify and you have all the other miriam israeli for instance that were talking about the complexity of uh, navigating um her creativity while uh, respecting her level of um modesty of tenuous um, so and you're you were able you're able to create this um we call it anthropology, it's going to sound a little bit weird to use the term here, but I'm going to use it, the global village, this global village and this global space. So between the, the global and the local, so to feel like this connection, but there is this space, which is your, your podcast. And then we can think about other spaces where women can be together, doesn't matter, and can share, can exchange, can disagree also. And what I think is amazing with what you were able to do is to, create the space where everybody is able to express their their challenges their opportunity and the other aspect is really to talk about the economy that's 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 the economy of and this is where i think i learned the most um because that was always so complicated to have this information and you really push that because um because it's it's I think it's taboo also to think about because there's this like, oh, it's always for tzedakah, it's always for, but which organization? How did you make it? Those questions that you, you raise that are so essential to think about how everything functions. And um, yeah, I would like to, to, in French we say chapeau bas. <laughs> I don't know how to, to say that, but, um, and, and this initiative is just, um, is just amazing. It's, it's, wonderful uh, that you were able to to think about this this podcast and to invite all the, the the women that you invited on it yes thank you for these words so number one 
in terms of talking about the economy, that was probably the biggest push for me to start this podcast because I was genuinely curious, what are other women doing? Because it's not working for me, at least when I started. And I used this platform as research. I used this as a tool to ask people mm -hmm. real questions. I also worked in certain industries where what you earn is public information and mm -hmm. it's a source of motivation for your team. Um, and I felt like keeping that a secret or not a secret, but something you don't discuss, something beneath mm -hmm. women in the arts mm -hmm. to talk about or anybody in the arts to talk about, mm -hmm. you, it's not you, going to serve anyone. You really complexify also the, the you know, talking about copyright, which is, uh, <laughs> which is, I remember I was writing a, a paper for a conference thinking about how, you know, today there's a challenge in copyrights. This little girl who composed a song, you know, she's working in a school, composed a song and uh, she was paid a hundred dollars. And then I said, did you write your name? Did you, and no, she doesn't know where the song is going to go. But I remember having this conversation with her and then she said, yeah, maybe I should, I should, I should ask, register. you know, yeah. you know, to register or at least that they can request to me how they should, you know, quote me and this invisibility in terms of, okay, we don't know who is singing. We don't know who is the composer. So it belongs to the collective, especially in the Hasidic space, which is another view of art. But you are bringing, because you're talking about the professor, so even if it's a different conception of copyrights, uh, but it's important to understand that they are different version. And then if you are entering an industry, the North American musical industry, there are certain standards, there are certain rules, and how do you navigate that? So that, that was also, I'm thinking about this because I remember you, you raised a lot of question in relation to that. Yeah. And another thing, as somebody who is against not showing women's pictures and I'm all about women's faces and women's mm -hmm. names and all that, it was hard for me to bring on some women. I disagreed in how they did certain things. I understand the not singing part, but there's nothing wrong with women's photos. Mm -hmm. And I recently I have accommodated them. I said th it's worth bringing them on and accommodating them and going against what I believe because it's more than me. It's more than yes. my personal opinion. Mm -hmm. And this is, this, is, this is what I'm saying, that you were able to, to bring the, the global into the, the local, into your, local. your podcast. Um, thank you so much, Dr. Jessica Roda. Thank you so much, Francesca, for the invitation. It was a great pleasure to exchange with you. And same here. We've learned so much. And uh, just a correction here, I might edit it in. Uh, our introduction was made by Miriam Leah Gamliel, not Rifka Harris. And Rivka Harris is just another mutual great person who we've been um, sharing a lot of mutual interest and information. Interest. Yeah. Yes. Okay. Thank Wonderful. you so much. Thank you so much, Francesca. Have a great, um, have a great day.